Good evening and welcome to our service of Celtic Evening Prayer. Hopefully um, you can see everything and you can hear everything and uh, we will begin with a hymn. I was, um, I was going to be very clever and uh, see if I could... Um, oh, actually, sorry, I've just realised you may not be seeing me because if some of you are still... Uh, unmuted, it means yes, Bessie is still unmuted, so that will. I'm going to mute you now. It's just that when if you're unmuted, it will take you will take precedence, so you will become um, on the main screen rather than me. Okay, no disrespect. Ah, Bessie's gone again. So hang on a minute. Oh no, she's muted now. That's fine. Right, ignore me. Um. Yes, uh, two apologies. One for not being able to start on time because of the internet connection. And the second thing is um, we had, I, I, working on the advice of Peter and Martin, I have experimented with all sorts of ways and means of microphones and recording and so on. And uh, Peter, you're absolutely right. It's the, it's the computer that won't record um, music properly. So um, I'm this week going to invest in the... Uh, a new computer with the BCC permission. So hopefully the recordings will be better next week. I'm just going to admit somebody else to the server. Right, our first hymn, The Kingdom of God is Justice and Joy. You'll probably recognise the tune um, even if you uh, are not familiar with the word. Kingdom of God is justice and joy for Jesus Christ. What sin would destroy? God's power and glory in Jesus we know. And here and hereafter the kingdom shall grow. The kingdom of God is mercy and grace. The captives are freed, the sinners find grace. The outcasts are welcome, God's banquet to share. And hope is awakened in place of despair. The kingdom of God is challenge and choice. Believe the good news, repent and rejoice. His love for our sinners brought Christ to his cross. Our crisis of judgment for gain or for loss. The kingdom is come, the gift and the goal. In Jesus begun, in heaven may fall. The heirs of the kingdom shall answer his call, and all things my glory to God for him. Now we come to the blessing of the light. The Lord is my light and my salvation. My God shall make my darkness to be bright. The light and peace of Jesus Christ be with you all. Blessed are you, Lord God, creator of day and night. To you be praise and glory forever. As darkness falls, you renew your promise to reveal among us the light of your presence. By the light of Christ, your living word, dispel the darkness of our hearts, that we may walk as children of light and sing your praise throughout the world. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever.
Let's sing. Like your gladness, Lord of glory. As the words are on the altar of service, I was um, trying to be clever earlier to be able to share it, but because I was struggling to get the internet, I literally just turned everything else off apart from Zoom. So hopefully you've got access to it or you've got it from last time. Light of gladness, Lord of glory, Jesus Christ, the King of glory, shine among us in your mercy, earth and heaven joy bear Let us sing as songs descending, as we see the light of evening. Father, Son, and Spirit praising with the Holy Son of God, through all the ages, worthy of the holiest praises, yours the life that never ceases, life which never shall go Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. O Lord, I call to you, come to me quickly. Hear my voice when I cry to you. Set a watch before my mouth, O Lord, and guard the door of my lips. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Let not my heart incline to any evil thing. Let me not be occupied in wickedness with evil doing. But my eyes are turned to you, Lord God. In you I take refuge. Do not leave me defenseless. Let my prayer rise before you as the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. That this evening may be holy, good, and peaceful. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As our evening prayer rises before you, O God, so may your mercy come down upon us to cleanse our hearts and set us free to sing your praise, now and forever. Amen. We draw near to the place of at one the place of time. Let us confess our sins. Let's read a brief Advent introduction and then we'll say this confession together. When the Lord comes, he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Therefore, in the light of Christ, let us confess our sins. Give us tears to see the wonder of your presence. Give us tears to see the waiting of your people. Give us tears to see the wounding of your son. We are the race that helped to make the wood on which you were crucified, and still we misuse your creation. We are the race that helped to make the nails that pierced your body, yet still we use work for gain at others' expense. We are the race that did nothing to stop your betrayal, yet still we are ruled by comfort or pain. Turn to us again, O God our Saviour, and let your anger cease from us. Lord, have mercy. Lord.
Show us your compassion, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Your salvation is near to those that fear you, that glory may dwell in our land. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. As Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, if all goes according to plan, I'm going to ask Chris if she will unmute herself and uh, she will read her Old Testament reading to us. Thank you, Chris. Our first reading this evening can be found on page 358 in the Old Testament part of our Good News Bible. It is from the first book of Kings, chapter 22, and I'm reading verses 1 to 28. This passage is called, The Prophet Micaiah Warns Ahab. There was peace between Israel and Syria for the next two years. But in the third year, King Jehoshaphat of Judah went to see King Ahab of Israel. Ahab asked his officials, why is it that we have not done anything to get back Ramoth in Gilead from the king of Syria? It belongs to us. And Ahab asked Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to attack Ramoth? I am ready when you are, Jehoshaphat answered. And so are my soldiers and cavalry. But first, let's consult the Lord. So Ahab called in the prophets, about 400 of them, and asked them, should I go and attack Ramoth or not? Attack it, they answered. The Lord will give you victory. But Jehoshaphat asked, isn't there another prophet through whom we can consult the Lord? Ahab answered, there is one more, Micaiah, son of Emiah. But I hate him because he never prophesies anything good for me. It's always something bad. You shouldn't say that, Jehoshaphat replied. Then Ahab called in a court official and told him to go and fetch Micaiah at once. The two kings, dressed in their royal robes, were sitting on their thrones at the threshing place just outside the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets were prophesying in front of them. One of them, Zedekiah, son of Chenahar, made iron horns and said to Ahab, This is what the Lord says. With these you will fight the Syrians and totally defeat them. All the other prophets said the same thing. March against Ramoth and you will win, they said. The Lord will give you victory. Meanwhile, the official who had gone to get Micaiah said to him, all the other prophets have prophesied success for the king. You had better do the same. But Micaiah answered, by the living Lord, I promise that I will say what he tells me to. When he appeared before King Ahab, the king asked him, Micaiah, should King Jehoshaphat and I go and attack Ramoth or not? Attack, Micaiah answered. Of course you'll win. The Lord will give you victory. But Ahab replied, When you speak to me in the name of the Lord, tell the truth. How many times do I have to tell you that? Micaiah answered, I can see the army of Israel scattered over the hills like sheep without a shepherd. 
And the Lord said, these men have no leader. Let them go home in peace. Ahab said to Jehoshaphat, didn't I tell you? He never prophesies anything good for me. It is also always something bad. Micaiah went on. Now listen to what the Lord says. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne in heaven with all the angels standing beside him. The Lord asked, who will deceive Ahab so that he will go and be killed at Ramoth? Some of the angels said one thing and others said something else until a spirit stepped forward approached the Lord and said, I will deceive him. How? the Lord asked. The spirit replied, I will go and make all Ahab's prophets tell lies. The Lord said, go and deceive him, you will succeed. And Micaiah concluded, this is what has happened. The Lord has made these prophets of yours lie to you, but he himself has decreed that you will meet with disaster. Then the prophet Zedekiah went up to Micaiah, slapped his face and asked, since when did the Lord's spirit leave me and speak to you? You will find out when you go into some back room to hide, Micaiah replied. Then King Ahab ordered one of his officers, arrest Micaiah and take him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Prince Josh. Tell them to throw him in prison, to put him on bread and water until I return safely. If you return safely, Micaiah exclaimed, then the Lord has not spoken through me. And he added, listen everyone to what I have said. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now we're going to sing. Um, in place of the psalm, it's number 192 in Songs and Fellowship, or you've got the words um, on the order of service. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. It's, uh, it's words from psalms that have been put into a song, and um, I think it'd be good for us to sing them. And we'll to talk more about. Ahab and Jehoshaphat a bit later on, okay? In case you're wondering what happened. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
to read our New Testament reading today. Our second reading this evening can be found on page 202 in the New Testament part of our Good News Bible. It is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 15, and I'm reading verses 4 to 13. The passage is entitled, Please Others, Not Yourselves. Everything written in the scriptures was written to teach us in order that we might have hope through patience and encouragement which the scriptures give us. And may God, the source of patience and encouragement, enable you to have the same point of view among yourselves by following the example of Christ Jesus, so that all of you together may praise with one voice the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Good news for the Gentiles. Accept one another then for the glory of God as Christ has accepted you. For I tell you that Christ's life of service was on behalf of the Jews to show that God is faithful to make his promises to their ancestors come true and to enable even the Gentiles to praise God for his mercy. As the scripture says, and so I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing praises to you. Again, it says, Rejoice, Gentiles, with God's people. And again, Praise the Lord, all Gentiles. Praise him, all people. And again, Isaiah says, A descendant of Jesse will appear. He will come to rule the Gentiles, and they will put their hope in him. May God, the source of hope, fill you with joy and peace by means of your faith in him, so that your hope will continue to grow by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks very much, Chris. Now, if you have the um, order of service, Let's um, say the Magnificat together, this Song of Mary. Words that she came out with when she knew she was going to bring God's Son into the world. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. He has looked with favour on his lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. 
and to scatter the proud in their conceit, casting down the mighty from their thrones and lifting up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has come to the aid of his servant Israel to remember his promise of mercy, the promise made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. Now, if you're already seated, fine. If not, you might wish to be seated or kneel for one thing. And we start with the Lord's Prayer. Jesus taught us to call God our Father. And so in faith and trust we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And the Collects of this second Sunday of Advent. O Lord, raise up, we pray, your power and come among us, and with great might aid us, that whereas through our sins and wickedness we are grievously hindered in running the race that is set before us, your bountiful grace and mercy may speedily help and deliver us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit we honour and glory now and forever. Amen. And the Collect of Advent. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and to put on the armour of light. Now in the time of this mortal life, in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to us in great humility, that on the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first comment for evening prayer. Evening Collect is on the altar service. If you have that, let's pray again. Lighten our darkness, Lord, we pray. And in your great mercy, defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Advent prayers we share in this wonderful season of expectation as we look forward to the coming of our Lord. Now, at the end of each section, I'm going to say an Aramaic word, Maranatha, which really meant our Lord come. And it was said at the end of every meeting of the first Christians, they believed that Jesus would come. And uh, if you look at the book of Revelation, it ends with um, Amen, Maranatha, would be in the original language. Amen, come Lord Jesus. So each time I say Maranatha, Let's say, Amen, come Lord Jesus. In joyful expectation of his coming to our aid, we pray to Jesus, come to your church as Lord and Judge. And this week we pray for the Reformed Episcopal Church of Spain and the church in Canada, Rwanda, Pakistan, Egypt, Singapore, Myanmar and Nigeria. 
In our own diocese of Chelsea, we pray for the deaneries of Dunlow and Stansted and Harwich, and for the Right Reverend Roger Morris, the Bishop of Colchester. Help us to live in the light of your coming and give us a longing for your kingdom. Maranatha. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come to your world as King of the nations. We pray for all the countries of the world struggling with coronavirus at present. Lord, we are beaten down. We are low. We are struggling. We're either in the grip of the pandemic or we're in fear of the hysteria stirred up by the media. Lord, help us to acknowledge that you are Lord. And it's only through you that there can be a solution to the problem. We pray for all governments and all rulers as they strive to make the world a better place for their people. We think about the negotiations for Brexit at the moment, which have paled into insignificance because of the coronavirus pandemic, and yet they are crucially important for our economic future. Lord, just give us a sense of proportion and help us to believe that you will help us solve the problem. Before you, rulers will stand in silence. Maranatha. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come to the suffering as saviour and comfort. We pray for all those who are in the grip of COVID-19. We pray for the doctors and nurses as they struggle to treat those who are ill. And we think of the names of people on our prayer list, some of whom have been affected by the coronavirus pandemic, but some of whom are just struggling with all sorts of other physical and mental problems. In a few moments of silence, let's bring those names and the names of people we know and love before the Lord and ask him to intervene in their lives. Break into our lives where we struggle with sickness and distress and set us free to serve you forever. Maranatha. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come to us as shepherd and guardian of our soul. We remember all those we love who have died. We pray for all who are bereaved, especially families going through difficult anniversaries at the moment. And we especially pray for bereaved people at Christmas time, when loneliness is going to be such a huge factor in life. Lord, we pray that you would give all people hope, real hope, certain hope for the future. Give us, with all the faithful departed, a share in your victory over evil and death. Maranatha. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come from heaven, Lord Jesus, with power and great glory. Lift us up to meet you, that with all your saints and angels we may live and reign with you in your new creation. Maranatha. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, do not delay. Give new courage to your people who trust in your love. By your coming, raise us to share in the joy of your kingdom on earth and in heaven, where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Now let's finish our prayers by saying the grace of us. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, evermore. Amen. Now, we're going to sing again. Um, this time it's a hymn from uh, 
Strong Associate, number 154, if you've got the book or if you've got the order of service, hark the glad sound of Saviour come, the Saviour promised me. meditations of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Jesus came into our world for all people. Jesus came to give the world hope. Jesus came as an example that we may follow him and live. So, we know that Jesus came as the Messiah of Israel, the Christ, the Chosen One, the One who had been long expected. It was foretold by prophet after prophet after prophet in the Old Testament. And finally, John the Baptist, the prophet who bridged the gap between the Old Testament and the New Testament, came to prepare the way for our Lord. And we were thinking a bit about that this morning. But Jesus also came as the saviour of the world. He didn't just come for the people of Israel. He came for everyone, which is good news for the Gentiles, the nations. And of course, Gentiles is anyone who's outside of Israel, anyone who's outside of God's people. So actually, brothers and sisters, it's rather good news for us because we're Gentiles. We're outside uh, the people of Israel and Jesus came for us as well. And the amazing thing is that God does not discriminate. Now, when God chose Israel to be his people, he wasn't just showing favoritism to one particular group of people. He chose the people of Israel so that they would be a light to shine out to all the nations, to show people what a relationship with the living God could be like. The idea being that all the nations would be drawn to Israel and say, wow, look at this people living in harmony and union with their God. He provides for them, he protects them, they give them honour and worship. But the trouble is that Israel failed miserably to be the light of the world. They rebelled against God time and time again. They were taken off into exile. They were restored, but still they rejected him. And they didn't shine out into the world. So, God 
into being. God broke into our world. God came in the person of his son, Jesus. He came to be the light of the world, to replace the light that Israel couldn't shine. He came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. He came to die on the cross, to take away not just the sins of Israel, but the sins of the whole world. The sins that hadn't been committed at the time he came, and all the sins that had been committed in the past, dealt with once and for all on the cross. And he came to offer forgiveness to all people by virtue of that one perfect, innocent death. Anyone who turns to him can look at the cross and be forgiven. And Jesus came to rise from the dead, to conquer death forever, and to give us the gift of resurrection and eternal life. Now, what may you say is the connection with the Old Testament story that Chris read to us? I, I have to say, whenever I hear stories like that, you really don't need to resort to um, film and TV to get thrills and spills. It's all in the Old Testament whichever way you look at it. And this Old Testament story concerns two kings. Now, Judah and Israel, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom, had fallen out badly. They'd been at war with each other. But Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, who was a man of great faith, a man after David's own heart, his ancestor, a man who obeyed God's will, he managed to get together with Ahab, who was one of the nastiest people who ever lived. And at least form a reconciliation between the north and the south. And Jehoshaphat went to visit him. Jehoshaphat was a man who listened to God. Ahab was a man who didn't. Ahab simply did his own thing to suit himself. And of course, Ahab's prophets were more concerned about telling Ahab what he wanted to hear rather than listening to God and telling the king the truth. And did you notice that Ahab had got 400 prophets, 400, who are all telling him, yes, go and attack Ramoth, it'll be fine, you'll win, God will give you the victory, no problem at all. But Jehoshaphat is much more savvy than Ahab, and he's saying, are you sure there aren't any other prophets? Oh yeah, there's one, Micaiah, but he never tells me what I want to know, he just gives me bad news. Jehoshaphat said, what do you have to if he's a prophet of the Lord, you must listen to him. So, they bring in the time. And you notice at first, he's being incredibly facetious, incredibly tongue-in-cheek. Oh, yes, they have. Go and attack Ramoth. It'll be fine. The Lord will sort you out. And then it's Ahab who says, oh, hang on a minute. You don't normally give me this kind of news. And then, Micaiah speaks in the name of the Lord. I can see the army of Israel scattered. No leader. Disaster is going to come upon them. So even now, even at the last minute, God is giving Ahab the chance to exercise his free will and believe in the message of Micaiah and maybe not go into war. But of course, he won't listen. To the truth. He won't listen to reason. And um, in fact, Micaiah gets thrown into prison as a result of listening to the Lord and coming up with God's will. And in case you're wondering what happened, well, you can read on in the chapter later on tonight if you wish. But Ahab did die. He went into battle. And you know what? Nasty man. He said to, said to Jehoshaphat, Oh, yeah, you wear your king's robes and go, go into the battle. I'll, I'll go in disguise. Um, and so Jehoshaphat's getting attacked because the king of Syria wanted to kill the king of Israel. But it says he cried out and uh, he, was, he was okay. Now, I wonder if that's because um, he cried out in a, in a southern accent. And that's why um, the Syrians didn't want to attack him. They wanted to get the king of Israel. But Ahab got hit by an arrow by mistake that went through the gap in his armour. And he lost so much blood that he died. So, what the prophet had said came true. And the test of prophecy throughout the Bible 
is if what the prophet says comes true, then the prophet is of God. If the prophet's words do not come true, then the prophet is a false prophet. So immediately, 400 prophets of Ahab would be written off as false prophets. And there are serious consequences for disobeying the law. And but you see, most people don't believe that. They think, oh, we can we can get around it. You know, God won't mind. We can do things, and He won't take any notice. We can just breeze through life regardless. Well, you can try that if you like. But the best way is to obey God's will, and the way we do that is to read the Bible. As Paul the Apostle said, all scriptures are given to guide us and show us the right way to go. We need to discover um, what we need to do, what God's will is for our lives. And then with God's help, we can put that into practice. But beware, do not be deceived. Now, you may have noticed that vision that uh, Micaiah had. He saw a spirit come before the Lord. Now, this is obviously an evil spirit, a spirit um, connected with Satan. He said, oh, I'll, I'll deceive Ahab for you if you like. And God says, how can you do that? Oh, well, I'll, I'll just get his prophet to tell him the wrong thing. So God allows it to happen because he knew that Ahab would not listen to reality. And the same thing can happen to us if we're not careful, because there are deceptive spirits in the world. Satan is alive and active, and he's trying to take us away from the truth. There are many, many false prophets in our world. Prophets of grief, prophets of misery, prophets of hysteria. You know, I sometimes think that some of the stuff we hear on the news about the uh, pandemic is, is hysterical. Yes, we know it's evil. Yes, we know it's bad. Yes, we know people are dying. But we also know that we need to be sensible. We need to wear our face masks. And we need to keep social distancing and we need to obey the rules. But the way sometimes the, the deception comes out, it almost seems that, oh, if you sneeze and take your mask off and catch the disease, you're going to drop down dead. There's a lot of hysteria around that. God does not want us to be deceived. He wants us to be sensible and he wants us to live according to his plan. And we need to read the Bible to see his plan for our lives and his way of doing things, and what his will is. Because things may be said to us that aren't true, but if we read the Bible, we can check that they are true. I want to finish with a quote. Um, I've recently been reading a, a little booklet written by um, the curate of uh, my church when I was a little choir boy back in Walthamstow, a man called Richard Atwood, who actually did um, a doctoral thesis at the Sorbonne University about creation, evolution, and the Christian faith. And he wrote these words. The Bible, it is true, is not a scientific textbook. But if the Bible is true, it is true on every level and is the divinely given framework for all knowledge. And the point he was trying to make is you can't have a double truth. You can't say, well, this bit of the Bible is true, but actually there's something going on in the world which rather contradicts that. But we'll think that's true as well. No. If the Bible is true, then it's true on every level. And it's the divine guidance that we need to live our lives. I remember seeing a film uh, years ago called um, Witness, starring Harrison Ford. And it was based on a, the Amish community in America, who are um, sort of puritanical Christians. And they're so strict with the Bible, if it's not in the Bible, they don't do it. So motor cars are not in the Bible, so they don't drive. Electricity is not in the Bible, so they don't have electric lights. They have candles and lamps. Um, and uh, it, it, I mean, some people think they're very, very silly. But it's really interesting seeing how this community operates. And they're still there today. And they just think the Bible is our guidance. And if it's not in the Bible, then it's probably not worth doing. It's not worth engaging in. But if it is in the Bible, then this is something we're going to do. The Bible
Father, we thank God. Do not be deceived by the world. Listen to God, because God speaks the truth. And that truth should be so relevant to our lives. Now, we come to our final uh, hymn or song. God has spoken to his people. Um, which is one of these um, sort of Israeli type uh, chants which gets a little bit faster and faster. Not on the machine, so um, I've actually got to play it on the guitar, so I'll try and get faster. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and the rains fall gently upon your feet. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the hollow of his hand. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Stay in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, Amen.